Hello, welcome to Jask Draws. I am Jask and I've got a new introduction for videos now. I wanted to do something a little more engaging and fun for the start of videos, so I hope you like it. Anyway, today's speed paint is a little bit different from the norm. It's the first installment in a four-part series of illustrations for my comic, The Eighth of Infinity. Each video will focus on a pair of characters who work with each other most often, and I'll talk about their personalities, relationships, and the story of The Eighth of Infinity itself. I'll also throw in some still image comparisons for the process at the end, like the sketch and then the line art, as well as answer any questions you might have about either the artistic process or the characters that were illustrated. I'll start the speed paint in a second, but before I do that, if you do have any questions about the characters, comic, art process, whatever you want to see, you can send me a tweet at jaskdraws, that's one word, on Twitter, or leave a comment on this video or on my Instagram. All the links for social media are across the banner at the bottom, as well as in the description. But now that I'm done talking about what's going to be in this speed paint, let's actually start watching it. I hope you enjoy it. So here's what we're starting with, a slightly inconsistent sketch of two gals, Circle Pit and Fable. Circle Pit is on the left and Fable is on the right. These two are called the Mercenaries, which is also the name of this illustration. Circle Pit in particular comes from a much heavier mercenary-esque background than Fable does, but before I can really explain their roles or who they work for, or anything about them, you guys are gonna need some information on what the Eighth of Infinity is as a whole. The Eighth of Infinity is a project that me and a few of my friends have been collaborating on for a number of years. It takes place in a dystopian setting where a group of powerful and extremely wealthy figures decided they wanted even more power and more wealth, so they orchestrated massive worldwide fires that raged all across the world for six years nonstop. This did a number to the Earth's resources and population and left nothing at all. Cities and capitals and forests, everything was reduced to basically nothing, and even the deserts were set on fire. Everything was an ashy, inhospitable wasteland. After the fires were eventually allowed to die out, survivors tried to resettle and figure out how to keep on surviving. Luckily, they didn't have to do much because a handful of settlements had already been founded here and there in areas that seemed to be hit a little less hard than the rest of the world. People flocked to these settlements and were openly welcomed by the leaders there. There was food, water, protection from the elements, medical aid, resources, stability, etc, etc. Soon, the settlements had to expand into cities in order to accommodate the growing population of refugees, and the leaders of these cities, now called the Saints, started to change the way they governed things. Curfews and restrictful laws started to be imposed, huge walls and layers and layers of defenses were built around the cities, and anyone who was caught being too outspoken or discontent with these new laws were punished outright. These changes were happening under the guise of safety and knowledge about the dangers beyond the walls that the people didn't have that the saints did. And the people inside were all too happy to comply when they got the news that fires were cropping up on the outside world once again. In just a couple of years, the cities had gone from welcoming havens of safety to rigidly governed territories. Refugees were no longer being allowed inside the walls, and they started to be branded as dangerous and aggressive people. Even the people on the inside underwent periodic, intense vetting processes to make sure that they were not threats either. If anyone had reason to believe that someone else was dissatisfied with how the saints were ruling, or if they weren't grateful enough, or if the saints themselves considered somebody to be a threat, they were either kicked into the unforgiving wasteland outside the city walls, which was called the Insolvent Sea, or they were executed for treason. This behavior became normalized very quickly, and in the next decade, the saints would become tyrannical dictators. The citizens beneath them followed them loyally, whether it was out of legitimate belief or fear, 
but whichever reason it was, the Saints didn't care as long as they continued to remain in power. Throughout their rise to power, the Saints continued to orchestrate fires in select locations. Specifically, they went after places where people had started to settle on their own. They'd burn these places to the ground and often sent soldiers to the area afterward to make sure that absolutely nobody even tried to keep the settlement going. Through these continuous and increasingly murderous orders, the people of the Insolvent Sea renamed the Saints and started calling them the Hollow Men. In response to the soldiers, the residents of the Insolvent Sea, the Insolvents, started organizing against them. There were specialized groups for the purpose of protection pretty much everywhere, and often there was more than one of these groups in any given settlement. The presence of these protectors resulted in greater violence from the Hollowmen soldiers until the Hollowmen themselves used the Insolvents' efforts of pushing back as evidence that they were really threats to the cities, and by extension, to the men themselves. So, after ramping up enough rumor and rage and tension amongst their citizens, the Saints issued a genocide order, and so the systematic slaughter ensued heavier than it had before. The sudden marches on their homes hit the insolvents incredibly hard, and it sparked an even harder push against the Hollow Men. Gangs switched gears from protection to rebellion and did their best to fight a war, but they were significantly outnumbered, outarmed, outskilled, and the insolvents did not do well. With the surface under more siege than it had been in years, insolvents started taking refuge underground or hid themselves in the burned and toxic ruins of cities. Most of the gangs who had names for themselves were lost and wiped out from the genocide order. If they survived, they had very few members, they were all fragmented, and it was very difficult for these gangs to work as whole units like they had before. In a few special cases, a couple of gangs had overcome the soldiers they fought and ended up fortifying themselves in a particular place on the surface. After losing enough men to these stronger and more hunkered down groups, the Hollow Men chose to ignore them, and so those groups survived. Most others, however, were not so lucky. Despite this, there was one group who never seemed to disappear entirely. They never named themselves directly, but even if the members themselves did not survive a siege, more members seemed to be right around the corner or they'd come around to protect people who needed it just in the nick of time. They were not concerned with fighting back like some gangs were, they were more interested in making sure that people survived. They were protectors, they were rescuers, they did all they could when they could, and they never seemed to go away. Over the course of this extermination order, the group was named by the people that it saved and they called it Infinity because of its never-ending nature. At the time when the comic begins, it's been 87 years since the fires first started. Most of the people who were around for the initial rise in power of the Saints and those who saw the extermination order begin are no longer alive. Exterminations haven't stopped, but they have slowed. People still live underground, they still live in toxic environments, but they frequently leave one area to go live in another so they're not in one place for too long. If they are lingering in one place for too long, it increases the chances that the Hollow Men are going to find them and send in soldiers to burn whatever they have. Some of the gangs who survived the extermination all those years ago still stand fortified in the exact places that they originally hunkered down. Infinity is one of these gangs, even though they did not fortify themselves in any given location. 
They are one of the widest reaching groups in the Insolvent Sea, however, and have members in almost every part of the sea. Under Infinity's previous leader, Infinity learned that it was the Hollow Men, the Saints, who orchestrated the worldwide fires to begin with 87 years ago. Everybody knew that they were responsible for the ones that started with the Genocide Order and haven't stopped since, but the information that they were the group who started this entire thing was brand new. In response to the information, Infinity started to divert members and resources towards a rebellious faction and hopefully towards a siege of their own. They still serve to protect and rescue people as they always had, but they've also taken up the head of the charge against the Hollow Men. And everybody in the Insolvent scene knows it. Not everyone supports Infinity's endeavors, however, and a lot of groups tend not to take them seriously at all. Now, Circle Pit and Fable here are two of the best mercenary rebels Infinity has to offer. As their name suggests, they are mercenaries. They get sent out to complete tasks that other less skilled members can't handle, and they're usually specialized tasks. Their jobs include things like defending bunkers from hostile gangs or clearing attackers from their territories, sometimes they're dispatched on rescues or assist in assaults. They've been working with the group for only a couple of years now, but their accomplishments and experiences have put them in high standing with other members. Circle Pit in particular has a unique upbringing that makes her more skilled than the average rebel and more trusted than one. She formerly belonged to and was raised as part of a dangerous and well-known mercenary gang, one of the ones who actually survived the original extermination order way back when. Fable was also with the same gang for a while, but it was only thanks to the kindness and mercy of Circle Pit that she lasted in it as long as she did. I can't get too much into their personal histories at the moment, since those details are part of the larger plot, but the important thing is that through their mutual history with the gang, they came to be with Infinity, and Infinity trusted them and trusted their skills. As partners, they do have a lot in common, which is why the two of them get along so well. They're able to balance fun and seriousness, they're both a little bit cocky in different ways, they're confident, and they're particularly good at turning tables at the last second. Circle Pit and Fable are also kind of... wisely impulsive? They're good at making decisions on the fly, but sometimes those decisions aren't the most strategically sound, or they put them at more risk than is necessary. Since they've been with each other for such a long time, there's a fair amount of mutual trust and expectancy in these improvised movements. They don't always have to communicate an improvised plan. For instance, if they were dispatched somewhere and got into a fight or something, and if simply brawling their way out of it wasn't enough to gain the upper hand, they obviously don't have time to sit there and strategize. So, one of them would make a move. Whoever moves first creates the perfect opening for the other, or one feigns failure while the other maximizes an attack, or a vulnerability, or gets into a position where they can pull the rug out from under the opposition. But they don't have to talk about that move. They have enough expectancy and knowledge and trust of each other to be able to do things naturally. They bounce off of each other, and it's a pretty unique thing that partners like this in Infinity tend to have. It's not always perfect, but the amount of trust that they have with each other is something that most of the partners do have. To talk about them more individually, I'll start with Circle Pit. 
Circle Pit, like I mentioned earlier, was raised in a mercenary gang in the insolvency. Growing up in an environment prone to violence, she was taught very young how to defend herself. She's been trained to deal with hand-to-hand -hand situations, grapples, all kinds of weaponry and firearms, you name it. Everyone from that gang has a similar skill set, it's not exclusive to her. Since this gang was one of the more ruthless groups in the Insolvency, everybody knows who they are and everybody knows to stay out of their territory. As such, it comes as no surprise that Circle Pit is a force to be reckoned with. Despite her upbringing though, she tries to pass fighting and violent confrontation off to the second or third choice rather than the first. Back home, she had quite the reputation for being more merciful than she should have, and that holds true to this day. In situations where she needs to exercise force, her preferred weaponry is anything with a bladed edge. She likes getting up close to her opponents, so she tends to use daggers and shorter blades like that. But she's not bad with a firearm, either. Fable did not come from the same gang-related roots as her partner does. In fact, her origin is pretty opposite to Circle Pit's, but again, I can't get into too much detail. I could talk about Circle Pit more openly than Fable because those details come into play pretty much right off the bat. So I'll talk about other things, like her skills as a demolitionist. She came to learn the craft a number of years ago and had a good focus for it. She really enjoyed the process and the care it takes to create the explosives, so it really stuck with her. She also has knowledge of other weaponry, like Circle Pit does, but it isn't her favorite thing to use. She very much prefers to blow up a wall and cover someone in rubble than she does to just stab them. Now, I mentioned earlier that the ruins of old cities and metropolitan areas were toxic. Toxic might not be the right word because it sounds more intense and gives an image of something that is not accurate, but basically, due to all the fires and how long they continued and how much damage they caused and all that, the air quality in cities in particular was awful. It was bad everywhere else too, but it was the worst where there was a lot of things to be burned. Ash would stick around in burning buildings and just in crevices and in ruins, and it was unable to be blown out of those ruins entirely. On windier days, the only thing that would happen was more ash would be blown in from other places. The air itself, everywhere, all over the world, was toxic. Since fires have still been utilized as a method of extermination and never quite stopped being used this way, the air is still not optimal to be breathing all the time. This brings me to my favorite design elements of the characters in the Eighth of Infinity, their masks. Most of the characters have masks. Way back when the first fires were raging, they were more practical looking, but as time went on and the need for them didn't necessarily go away, society in the insolvency evolved and wearing masks was just a social norm. People eventually started to customize these masks for both fun and style. Gangs very quickly picked up on this idea. Their masks were often used as methods of identification and were sometimes considered uniforms. They still served the purpose of being able to help you breathe more safely, but their purpose went beyond just that. The members of Infinity do not have a uniform mask, as I'm sure you can tell by how different Circle Pits and Fables are. Infinity doesn't like the idea of matching masks, mostly because they don't like the idea of the uniformity. Not having the uniform mask is also a great way to identify their members or people they're trying to meet. Fable's mask is a bit different from your run-of-the-mill face cover, though. As you can probably see, Fable only has one goggle lens, and that is because she only has one eye. 
The other side of her mask, where a lens should be, is instead a flat cover with a strap that wraps around the back of her head and has a closed, stitch-looking eye on the front of it. It's a little bit difficult to see from this angle, though. She lost the eye and suffered a number of burn wounds to her face, chest, and arm due to an incident a handful of years ago. With the need for masks in this day and age anyway, it makes for the perfect eye patch and compression mask combo to reduce scarring and help her cover up. She's a bit self-conscious about the facial scars to a degree, but is less so about the ones on her chest and arm. She doesn't take off the mask super often because of it, but who knows, we might see it on screen at some point. That is more up to Fable's writer than it is to me, though. Speaking of Fable, I had very little to do with her design, her details, or her creation at all. She was brought to life entirely by one of the other contributors to the Eighth of Infinity, and all I had to do was take the sketches and concepts I was given and put them into the setting and style. I did end up making a few changes along the way, but nothing super extravagant or different. I added the belts and the leg pocket pouch thing, but those changes were for practicality's sake rather than like, ooh, I don't like it. Fable can carry a lot of equipment on her sometimes, so she had to be able to carry it somehow, and so I gave her some belts. In this illustration, though, neither she nor Circle Pit were working on anything that necessitated the equipment, so they don't really have much with them. Circle Pit's mask in design went through a number of changes. She had the same general look through it all. She was a hooded character with almost the exact same mask design. Originally, the mask was literally round, a circle, but over time it became fitted to an actual mask shape and her hood became less of a hood and more of a headscarf. She always had the consistent theme of X's, as you might be able to see in this illustration. The mask eyes, her belts, her shoelaces, they're all X's. Unlike Fable though, her mask does not have any special importance or spe secondary use. And she does take it off when she doesn't need it, so you'll definitely get to see her beautiful face. So, now that I'm out of footage, here's some comparisons for what we started with and where we finished. Here is the sketch again. Yes, delightful. I actually drew like half of this for Inktober a few years ago, where Fable was by herself tucked behind a rock and listening for a distant explosion to go off. When I was brainstorming ideas for the Mercenaries illustration, I was having a really hard time coming up with something, so I was flipping through some older art I'd done for inspiration. I saw the Fable drawing and decided to fix it up and add Circle Pit in there. And here's the line art. You'll notice that at some point the composition changed a little bit. I started messing around with it between drawing sessions and just forgot to record it, but it was mostly just a bunch of selecting and scaling and scooting things over. The original drawing left a lot of room for the explosion to be shown at the top, but since I wanted to get rid of the explosion, I didn't need all that negative space, so I chose to focus on the characters more and made changes accordingly. And here's the finished product! I'm very happy with how this piece turned out, and I'm super excited to do the next ones. I hope you enjoyed this video and the mercenaries, and I hope the Eighth of Infinity sounded a little interesting. I'm very excited to pick up the story and start working on it again. Thank you for sticking around and watching this extremely long video. I'm sure that the other ones are not going to be this long because I don't have to talk about the Eighth of Infinity itself as much in those other ones. 
If there's anything you'd like to know about the comic or these two lovely gals, please don't be afraid to ask. You can leave a comment here or tweet something at me on Twitter. Handles are going to be on the screen and in the description. It'd be really lovely to hear from you. If you're interested in the comic, the introduction and the first few pages of it are available on the 8th of infinity.com and on Webtoon. Once again, links will be in places. I'm gonna wrap up this super long video now, so thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your time and attention. This has been Jask Draws, I am Jask, and I hope to see you next time. Have a good one.